All right. Okay. <laughs> RMS. RMS versus peak quantities. Let's start there. Okay. So um RMS is something you guys are familiar with already. So first of all, we talk. So this is the difference between AC waveforms and DC waveforms. An AC waveform looks like what I have right here. So it in in theory, an AC waveform, true AC waveform has zero average. All right. Um, and I'm not going to touch on that, but basically this guy takes on infinitely many different values. It goes up and down or whatever. Um, and when we talk about a DC voltage, right? It takes on, you know, it's one value. Okay. Um, now here's a question. So when you, so if an AC waveform takes on infinitely many values, if you've ever seen an electrician or whatever, and you, an electrician basically sticks, you know, the multimeter into the wall socket, you get one number with a multimeter. What one number do you get from it? If I were to associate, if I said how many volts are right there in that outlet, what would the number be? 120. 120. Now, where does that, how does that 120 relate to that sine wave? It's the root mean squared value of it. All right, now that's a weird number. Like what the heck is a root mean squared? Well, we're gonna give the definition of a root mean squared if you don't know it, but I'm not gonna deal with the mathematical definition of it so much. My first thought would have been, well, why not use the amplitude, right? I mean, that seems like a logical thing to use. Use the amplitude of it, because that tells me if I wanted to draw the sine wave, that tells me how to draw it. I know it's frequency. I know it's phase. I know it's amplitude. I can always draw it. But we don't use that, all right? And there's a reason for it. Um, the reason for it, as we'll see, we'll talk about next week. Um, what I'm doing today is introducing the concept of RMS, because technically phasers, we've been doing phasers by using the amplitude. Typically, when anybody's dealing with an AC waveform, they actually deal with the RMS value of that waveform. And that's the number that's put in the phaser. So for the rest of the semester, from today onward, that's how I'm going to do it. All right? Not on exam four. Okay? For everything past this point, that's how it's going to be. Is I'm going to use phasers. Okay? Um, or when I do my phasers, I'm going to use RMS. So there's a reason for it. As we'll see, basically, how do you compute power? <clears throat> I said, okay, what's the power in a resistor? What is it? B times I. Okay. Well, that's easy if I had, a, say, a one ohm resistor with this 240 um, DC voltage, the power would be 240 watts, right? Or no, it wouldn't. It would be 240 times 240 watts, right? If I had a one ohm resistor. All right. So, that's nice and easy to calculate. How would I do it with this guy? Well, that's a lot harder, all right? As it turns out, if I use RMS, then I can have one number that I can apply to figure out quote unquote average power, okay? So that we'll talk about next week. Today, I just wanna to introduce this concept of what RMS is, okay? So you talk about an AC waveform, you talk about a bunch of different numbers, all right? So basically there's, there's three common numbers that are sometimes talked about. You go to the lab, um, I think in the lab nowadays, the, the function generators, depending on who's making the ones that are in the lab these days, sometimes they call the amplitude and they actually give you the V peak to peak value, all right? The amplitude is the peak, V peak. Uh, the V peak to peak is basically from top to bottom. So looking at this, if this guy has an amplitude of A, what's V peak to peak? 2A, all right? Now the RMS value is the peak value divided by the square root of two. So in this case, V peak would be A, all right? V peak to peak would be A minus, here we go, A minus minus A, so two A, so from peak to peak. And then the RMS value works out to be A divided by the square root of two. All right, now that, that is by definition what we call the root mean squared. For those of you who are mathematically inclined, you can look at the definition of it, all right? This is it. For a waveform X, all right? If you compute the root mean squared value, that is the definition of it. The square root, what is that? Why is it root mean squared? I see a root. It's the root of the mean of the squared waveform. So in other words, what, when I say the mean, what the heck is the mean? The average. By, what's the average of a sine wave? What's the average of this guy? Zero, right? So the average value is not very helpful to me. But if I squared this thing, all right? So that's what happens. You take the waveform, you square it, and then you take the average of that. That's what this is here. One over T over, so I, when I have a 
Integral over a period times one over T, that's the average of the waveform. So taking the average or the mean of the square, and then I take the square root of that. It's kind of random, doesn't it? Yeah, it does at first, right? And it, and it does, but what it what is nice about it eventually is if I use this, then my power expressions ultimately become such that I can take one number out of the waveform without doing any math or any kind of funky math to be able to nicely have a B times I still as my power. Okay, so that we'll see. But for a sine wave, I derived it out here. You can pay attention to it if you want to. But basically what it says is the RMS value for a sine wave is V over the square root of two. So whatever the amplitude is over the square root of two. All right. So that said, this is the waveform I get. Uh, I don't know if this was measured in Epic, probably measured in Epic. This is the voltage waveform off of the grid here in Epic. Um, so I see a couple of different things here. Uh, first of all, is that a sine wave? It, uh, yeah, it, why, well, what's it look like? Uh, well, okay, it's, it's, it's a little flat top. That's not uncommon, that's actually pretty normal. Um, it's actually a little bit worse than Epic. This guy actually has harmonics in it, is what I would call it. What's a harmonic? Anybody know? Yeah, frequencies that are multiples of each other, right? That that actually happens for various different reasons, but this is pretty common because of quote unquote nonlinear loads in the world, like computers that that actually cause the voltage to distort a little bit. Duke does a pretty good job. Any utility does a pretty good job of making sinusoidal voltages out of their generators, and the customers do a do a nice job of messing those up. All right, and so that's basically what this what this is going. This is pretty normal, uh, but it's nonetheless, it's pretty close to that. And even if it is distorted, you'll notice here a couple of different things. So what do we see? The RMS value is 122.56, all right? So that's the number that we always quote, 120. Um, and it's close to that. It's actually, Duke has an obligation to keep it within a particular band, all right? So they're, they're within that band, uh, about 122. In fact, you'll see it higher in the morning than you will in the afternoon. Often it varies throughout the day. Um, the top value, the peak value is 165 and the frequency is about 60 Hertz. All right. So that's what we would see if we were looking at, at the, at the value. So we use that number. So in this case, 120, that means the peak value, if it's really 120, the peak value would be 169. All right. 120 times the square root of two. All right. And that is about normal for what you have in your house. And we'll talk about your, what does your house actually have? You have 120. How many 120s do you have in your house? Anybody know? Two. Yeah, very good. All right. So I actually get 240 in my house. All right. We're going to talk about what that what that means um, uh, later. But anyway, that's that's what we begin with. So this guy's peak value is apparently 165. It should be if it were a pure sine wave and this were 122, then the it should be about 170. All right. But that's because it's not a pure sine wave. OK, but this is just the reality of what we see. OK. All right. Um, oh, I guess I did put that picture in here. Um, yeah. So if you look at what's in a house, this is the way your house is wired. And I'll skip ahead for a second. Uh, oh, I didn't. I don't really have that. here. Well, I, OK, I do. Um, so that picture here, the second, basically, these are the two types of plugs you have in your house. Um, so. You look at a plug and it looks at you like this, right? All right, that's what a plug looks like. So it's got a long blade and a little blade. Um, basically, this is the, from a perspective of, this is the plus and this is the minus. All right, so it's a voltage source behind that guy. Um, and so what what I have here is between, between those two, I have 120 volts RMS. Um, this guy here is earth ground. All right. That is actually tied to the to the true earth. And then I, I give these guys names. I call this the hot and call this the neutral. The neutral is grounded, but it is not at ground, which is to say that the ground, that's that's the green wire. Here. So, so it's showing this here like, the, OK, so this, here's the picture. So in terms of what gets into the house, the hot is the is the black. The neutral is the white. The neutral is grounded, 
but you'll see that current should be flowing out of there into whatever the load is and then back through the neutral. Does any current flow through this ground thing? No, what you see is the ground wire connects to like the, so in this case, it's, I guess it's a dryer, right? How can I tell this is a dryer? It could be a washer. It looks like a washer too, doesn't it? But how can I tell it's a dryer? Because it's a resistor, right? What's inside of a, dry, of a washer? A motor, right? Basically just a spin cycle. And I guess some valves to open up the water and stuff like that. But, but a dryer would have a crap ton of resistance all right, to be able to, to generate heat. Okay, so um, what's this guy doing? Well, he's grounding the case, he's grounding the box, right? Why would that be a good thing, any idea? Yeah, in case something comes loose, basically if one of these wires, particularly if that wire comes loose and that wire touches the case, if the case wasn't grounded and you touched it, the case would be quote unquote hot. Like it would feel like it was energized. Um, now, if I had my hand on ground or if I was standing in a puddle, then current would flow through my body and kill me, right? Don't do this at home, but if you if you just touch the voltage and the other side of you is not grounded, you'll just feel, you'll feel a funny sensation. All right, you won't die. Don't do it, because if you're not doing it right, then you will die. Um, <clears throat> but if you're doing it right, you'll, you'll just feel it. Now, what, why is it good if it's grounded? Well, if that hits the side and it's grounded, what's going to happen? A lot of current's going to flow, and the breaker's going to open up as a result. So for your safety, is why they ground it. Okay. Anyhow, um, this is the other type of outlet, which has, quote, unquote, two hots. Right? So this is what you get in the house. Um, you get one that has 120 angle zero and one that has 120 angle 180. So if you looked at one, if you took an oscilloscope in your house and you went to one side of the house and the other side of the house, you might see that the voltages were out of phase by 180 degrees. If I add those two together or subtract them, right? If I do 120 angle zero minus 120 angle 180, what do I get? You can get 240 angle zero, right? So that goes to some loads that we connect across both lines. All right, so the air conditioner is one, one example. But in general, my, my loads look something like like that, okay? And I, ter I turn them hot and neutral. All right, so I, again, we will, we're from this point forward, I'm gonna use my phasers in terms of RMS value. Doesn't change anything about the angle, right? The angle is whatever it is, but everything else is gonna be in terms of, of uh, the, ma the magnitudes are gonna be in terms of RMS, okay? Now, there's not much more to say about that other than that's what the RMS value is. I, I don't think I'll ask you weird, questions. I could give you all kinds of waveforms and start asking you what the RMS values are, but I'm going to really only deal with sine waves. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't matter which apply. I mean, isn't it like the circuit breaker isn't like one half for one at um, angle zero and then for one half? Ideally, the house should be set up so that half of the load is on one phase and half the load's on the other. Okay. But, you know, it's kind of random chance. Right. I mean, it, in general, it should be that way. I mean, you could plug in everything in your house on one phase, but highly unlikely that you will. Well, what's the advantage of um, What's the advantage of splitting a load between phases? Yeah. Um, if you really had a lot of imbalance, boy, you're okay. You got to speak. Um, I don't know if I can answer that here. So basically, you're going to start to get those voltages would be be different from each other. They wouldn't both be 120 uh -huh. if I did that. The reason for that is because it's not really correct that I have a voltage source, right? Looking into that mm -hmm. that outlet, I actually have a Thevenin equivalent circuit which has a voltage source and some impedance. So the voltages would start to get a little bit different. Uh, and if everything was like that, then they would start to get really different. But in general, I mean, they set them up so it's not likely to happen that way. Anyway, go. Yeah. All right. Um, these are the things people always want to start asking about. Um, so anyway, that's all I really have to say about that. Basically, the peak value divided by the square root of two is what you guys need to know. Now, why we do that, we'll get to when we start talking about power next week. But I want to talk about transformers first. What is a transformer? It's what? More than meets the eye, right? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, what is a what is a transformer? Yeah, converts, voltage. converts voltage to another. Probably you're you're most familiar with it. Like you go around my neighborhood, you'll see a green box, right? Um, and that green box says 25 kVA typically, right? So we're going to talk about what kVA means here in a little bit. But those transformers are basically going from probably probably 24 kV, 23 kV down to 240 volts. Okay. Um, so they're going they're going down to whatever the 240 volts is that goes into the house. So if we talk real quick about what a transformer does, and we'll get back to my story. Basically, the the transformer, what it does primarily is it transforms voltages up and down. All right, and there's reasons for for doing that. Um, so this is kind of like what the power system looks like, at least under the original design of it, um, where you basically had power plants that output voltages about 20, 20 ish KV. Um, so about 20 kilovolts is probably what a power station is going to output. And it's going to step that up to 130 KV, something like that, maybe 500 kilovolts uh, on what we call the transmission system. So you see those big metal towers that are out there, right? That's typically on the order of a couple hundred KV. Then I have, so like these, the pole mounted transformers, so you've probably seen those. You look up on a pole, what's that little can? That's a transformer. Okay, or the transformers that you see, the green boxes, right? Those will step down, and and to be honest with you, there's there's more transformers that I'm showing here. Basically, you would go up to about 100 and some kV for long distances, then you go down to about 20 ish kV on what we call the distribution system. That's our wooden poles that you see, and some of that's underground now. Um, and then there's going to be another set of transformers that go from these guys into the house. Right. So basically in your house, you got 120. This guy starts out at 20 kV. So I go up to a really high value and then back down. All right. We're going to talk about why we do that. Yes, sir. Why does that have to go up? So we're going to we're going to get to that in a, in a couple minutes. All right. Um, there's two reasons why we do it. I've got one of both of them here. Right. There's there's probably at least one more that I can think of. But. Um, isolation and the scaling of voltage and current levels is something we're going to talk about here for a second. But let's deal with how they work. All right. So basically, Faraday's law. What's Faraday's law? You guys took physics too. What's that? Somebody said something. Yeah. Well, sure. It deals with electromagnetism. What's... What is Faraday's law telling? Any idea? Got something for me? So when you produce a current for the wire, you produce a magnetic flux that follows right angle that would go to a magnetic core that goes back to another coil that produces okay. a current to another magnetic flux. Wow. Well, all right. My, Professor, my you're close. Yeah. All right. Professor Faraday over here got it set up. All right. So, so basically, um, what basically what it says, you know, sure. If I if I create a magnetic field, changing magnetic field, and I place a coil into that changing magnetic field, there will be a voltage generated in that coil. All right. So, um, if I were to, I don't want to do it this way. I want to say like if I if I um, placed so if there was a changing magnetic field running through this thing let's say that and I keep saying the word changing magnetic field if there is a changing magnetic field passing through this there will be a voltage here the V of T all right and this this has to be a what's the variable we use for magnetic fields B yeah if there's a dB by dt there will be a V of T right there all right. And that that's the basic principle by which power is generated. Right. What happens? You basically take you take a magnet and you make it spin. And as that magnet spins at 60 hertz, it creates voltages in the coils inside the generator. Right. That that's the core principle that we generate power by. Or at least we did for a um, 100 years. OK, now we now we do it different ways, but but that's still the primary way that we do it. OK. 
All right, so you get this V of T that's created. And so we can use that. The idea of a transformer is basically to say, so I got the right hand rule here, right? So if I have, you know, in this case, a coil with a current going that direction, right? Into this coil, I showed the way that the B field will go, right? So I did the right hand rule for that, right? So basically um, I do my fingers in the direction of the current or my, my thumb in the direction but fingers are going to point in the direction of the field, right? So there's a field that comes up through the through the middle of that thing. If I put, let's say, another coil right here, so I think that's what I, yeah. If I just put another coil here, like that, okay, what would happen? Well, what I'm saying is that there, and we can think about directions. I don't want to get lenses law, and there's all, you've learned things that you forgot. Um, <laughs> to figure out that there's going to be some other voltage that's created right there. All right. That's the basis of a magical kind of principle in a way. It says, if I put a current in this loop, I can transfer basically charge to, or I can transfer energy to another place. Okay. Now you use that, you go to the airport in Charlotte, right? You may have seen that if you've been to that airport and you can stick your phone down on a, on the benches and it'll start charging your phone. Right. Um, that's actually the same principle. Basically, what's going on is there's an induction charging happening. So I'm basically I got a magnetic field from the seat that's basically um, being received by a coil inside your phone. All right. So it's a principle that that's pretty commonly used for a lot of different things. All right. So this is the idea of induction. I induce the voltage in this other coil. All right. And it's Faraday's law. I don't need to write out Faraday's law. All right. Um, I probably did here in my in my notes, but I'm not going to get into it too much. This is what a transformer looks like in theory. All right. Is it it has if you ever walk by a transformer, you'll hear a noise. Okay. It's got this buzz. And that buzz would be at 60 hertz. What what's actually happening is there is iron inside this thing. Okay. Now, why do I have iron? Anybody know what's the deal with iron? Magnetic. Ferromagnetic. How's that good? Any idea how that's good? What's that? Free electrons. Okay, that's this sounds like some modern physics stuff. Um, it's probably it's probably a true statement. I, I I'm lost on some of that stuff, but that's probably true. Um, what does it what does it mean to be? Uh, what's what's a magnetic material? What's good about copper? Copper is conductive. So what does that mean? That means that basically if I hook a voltage source to it and I hook a load to the other side of it, that electrons are going to move through it and they're not going to go into the air. They're going to move through the copper, get to where they need to go to do something, the resistor or the motor or whatever, and then they're going to get back to the voltage source. All right. Well, we can make a whole analogy for magnetics that this is a quote unquote magnetic circuit, right? What I do is I hook a voltage source up one coil wound on this thing. If I hook this coil up right and the current flows in that way, the magnetic field, if I do the right hand rule, magnetic field is supposedly going to go up this way and around like that. Now here's the thing. If I just had a coil like I have here, where's the magnetic field go? Well, it, and what's true about magnetic fields? You guys learned in physics too. You got electric fields, magnetic fields. Electric field does what? I got a charge. Where's the electric field go? You weren't expecting this today. Right? So the electric field, electric fields go out, right? They just go out. Magnetic fields go in a circle. They're always closed, okay? In other words, like this magnetic field line right here, you can go back around like this. And there's gonna be one over here that does the same thing. The magnetic field lines are just gonna go around in those circles like that. Not really directed anywhere. If I put, that coil, that same coil around this magnetic material, what happens then? It's, it's going to be forced to go around it. This magnetic material is like a conductor. It's like a magnetic conductor. Basically what it does is it guides the field over to this coil. All right, so it makes sure that I basically give me a way to aim the field. That's really what's going on is it's aiming the field to the other coil. And I have a different number of turns in the two coils. And the different number of turns basically lets me guide, essentially, 
the to create a particular voltage on the secondary side. All right. Like I said, a common thing might be those transformers that you see like in your neighborhood, those green guys are probably, you'll see them 24 kV to 240 volts, right? So what that says is the primary side, so we're using the terms already, the primary side has 240, or sorry, 24,000 volts. The secondary side has 240 volts, all right? There's a turns ratio there. Now you can go from the physics, but that's the basic physics of it. It's basically this iron is guiding the fields over to the other side of this thing, right? That's the basic principle. Okay, all right. So um, the question would be, why do we use them? One reason I say is isolation. I could talk about that one later. But the scaling of voltage and current levels, what's gonna happen with these things? So basically what's happening is, if I think about it this way, power is going to flow into the primary. So I can use that power flows, right? So power is going to flow, meaning what does that mean? Power is going to flow. Well, energy is going to come out of this guy and end up over here eventually. That's the way the whole thing works. Is energy starts out in some gas molecules or whatever and eventually gets burned up and, and moves its way over to here. Okay. So energy is flowing through this system. So in this case, what I'm saying is, is, is power moves into here and leaves here. And we're talk about you know the power concept a little bit more, but that should be fairly straightforward to understand. Okay, well, what's going to happen here? Well, how much power? If I have power going in here and out here, how does that relate? Without talking about power at all, what has to be true? If power goes into a system, and so I think of this transformer as a system. If power goes in. How much power can come out? The same. Right, that's the first law of thermodynamics, right? Energy is neither created nor destroyed. So I, I'm gonna have power, whatever power enters here, some of it can be lost as heat, but the majority of it should go over to the secondary side where this load is, all right? So if that's true, you would say the power in equals the power out. Now, without deriving the relationships here, if I if I do this and I say, well, let's, so power ultimately is V times I, right? So we're gonna get to that later. So V, V1, I1, let's say that's this side and V2, I2 here, okay? Now what's gonna happen with this thing and we'll derive this out here in a second, but basically if the voltage on one side is higher than the voltage on the other, what has to be true about the current? Current has to be less. All right, so the voltage on the side with the higher voltage, it's always gonna have less current. So let's think about the power system here, right? So I go from 20 kV up to say a number like 500 kV. All right, and then I go back down to 240. What's the longest lines in the system? It's those big metal poles, right? Those guys run all over the country, right? Why would I, so what's gonna happen? So what's true about the current? So, so whatever power is needed here, right? In an ideal world, whatever power is needed here has to come out of the fuels, fossil fuels over there, right? So what's gonna be true about the current as the voltage goes up? It can go down, right? So where would I want the current to be the smallest? Well, on the longest wires, right? Why would I want the current to be the smallest on the longest wires? Less I squared R, right? So there's you, you don't want to have I squared R. So I squared R is power, right? So if I have a if I have a line that has a long run, it's gonna have a lot of ohms. So I'd like to keep its I really, really low. So the I squared R is minimum. Yeah, that's why they do it. Okay. So on the transmission system, we tend to take the voltage up high so that we don't have those, those loss. Okay. All right, because ideally you would want the power that flows out of here to be whatever I have here. In general, if you talk about the power that you have at your house, though, in, in, just to be clear about the losses that happen, if I talk about the power that comes out of the power plant, or really, to be really careful, if I talk about the quote unquote primary energy, right, that's coming out of the fossil fuels, if I talk about what that would be, the power coming out of the fossil fuels would actually be about three times more than what goes to the loads right here. 
All right, so there's actually a lot of losses in that system. And so you're trying to minimize those losses pretty significantly. All right. I don't want to say too much, but does that answer your question? Okay. The isolation piece is a slightly different one, but um, isolation I'll talk about a little bit later. So what we talk about is the ideal transformer. All right. And I use the term flux because what we really talk about, like we convert the magnetic fields over to flux. You probably heard that term in physics too. It probably is lost from your brain, but you heard it. Um, this is what we, this is the circuit symbol for this. Now, an important point that I, that I always like to make is those are not inductors, right? That is an ideal transformer. The, they're not, they're not trans, they're not inductors. They look like two inductors in a face off, all right? But they're not, all right? This is just a new circuit symbol and it, it represents a transformer. We call it the ideal transformer. What makes it ideal? It has no losses, I mean, no heat losses. And all of the magnetic flux that goes from one coil gets to the other. Those are the two things that make it ideal. We are only gonna consider ideal transformers. We're not gonna consider non-ideal transformers, okay? All right, so it's, it's no transformers perfect. The big ones come pretty close to being perfect, all right? <clears throat> um, so this is, this is what we've got here. So I've got two coils. I'm gonna use everything in, in basically uh, the primary side is always going to have a subscript one. The secondary side is going to have a subscript two. Um, and I'm going to use these dots. All right. So we're going to talk about the dots. So I got a, I got two dots on my transformer. And we're going to talk about the dot notation. Basically, the dot notation ends up being that if I make a current flow into one dot, then the current's going to flow out of the dot on the other side. Okay. So we're going to use that notation a little bit as we go. Now, what's the other thing I added here? I added this N1 to N2. What is that? Turns. turns ratio. So it's the ratio of the number of turns on one side and the number of turns on the other side. Okay. So side one has N1 turns, side two has N2 turns. All right. So um, I think I was thinking about doing this from the perspective of trying to relate the fluxes. Um, I don't think I want to do that. Um, I could do that. I'll, I'll publish it in the final version of those for those who are interested. But basically what it's saying is, is the flux, that's well, actually not too bad. But I guess the flux going through, the magnetic flux going through one coil is the same as it goes through the other coil. You guys follow that? I mean, basically if that line is going around like that, the closed line, the flux through one side, flux through the other is the same. All right. So that means basically the flux through coil one. So flux is written as phi. Phi one has to equal phi two, right? <clears throat> now, if I take Faraday's law basically tells us um, flux is always equal to N. What is flux equal to? Everybody know? If I had a magnetic field here, if I remember. Basically, what I'd find out is phi is equal to the number of turns times the magnetic field times the area, all right, the NBA principle, all right? Um, so basically, the magnetic flux is equal to N times the B field times the A, the area of the coil. That's the magnetic flux. If I take the derivative of that with respect to time, that's the changing flux. The changing flux is the voltage, okay? That's Faraday's law. The changing flux is the voltage. So if I if I take the derivative of that expression, phi equals n times b times a, does the area of the core change over time? Hopefully not. That'd be weird. Um, does n, the number of turns, change over time? No. So basically what I get is that it's n times a times db by dt. All right? If I put all that together and I take the derivative of both sides of that thing, what am I going to end up with? Well, what I'm going to end up with is that basically V1 over N1, so the voltage on the primary over the number of turns on the primary is equal to V2 over N2. All right, for me, that's, what I, that's one of the things that I remember about this. For an ideal transformer, this is how I relate the voltages. Okay. All right. So V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. 
Now we have this, this is sort of two key relationships, one that relates the primary and secondary voltage and one that relates the primary and secondary current, okay? We already know the one that relates the primary and secondary current, all right? Because what's gonna be true? We said about the power, <clears throat> powers have to be the same. So the voltage goes up, the current has to go down and has to go down proportionally, yeah. Oh, what do you mean? The area, I mean, if I if you look through the derivation of this whole thing, you'll see why area gets neglected. But basically, what's going to be true about phi 1 and phi 2? Well, they're going to have the same, this coil and that coil have the same area because they're on the same core. They're going to cancel each other out. Their number of turns is different, though, right? All right, anyway, that's where that comes from. Again, I'll... I'll put the whole math in the thing I post so you can look at it if you want to. Um, basically, what we see is, is, is this. So we use this dot notation. In general, that is true. V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. If I want to play games with you, then I can. And I can say, well, if the, if the plus signs are both the dots, this is correct. If the minus signs are both the dots, that is correct. If they switch, they're both not at the dot. In other words, if this, if the plus sign was here and the minus sign was here, I would have that relationship. It's a passive sign convention type of thing. Basically deals with the reality of how I wind the coils on the transformer. All right. I probably don't, I don't deal with that too much to trip you up. I just want you to kind of know how to deal with these and problems. Okay. So this is the, the key relationship for the voltages. Now, the other is the power relationship gives me the current relationship. So the way I've drawn this guy, I would say P1 plus P2 equals zero. Right? The way I've drawn this, because I'm thinking of this thing as a system, and I'm saying I got power going in here and in here. So what do I mean by in? Well, basically, I know that I have a, I have, a current going into a plus sign. That's power going in. You learned that at the very beginning of 2111. And you're using it all the time with passive sign convention, all right, whether you remember it or not. right? Basically, we're saying both sides of these guys have power going in. So as a system, the total power always has to be, to in this case, always kind of summed to zero, all right? which means the power in equals the power out. So if I'm doing this, I would have, how would I, what would I say? I say I have V1 I1 plus V2 I2 equals zero. Okay. I got that. So what do I know about the voltages here? They're different. And I know that V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. Like that. So that I can plug that in here and I can say I got V1 over uh well so let's do it this way. V1 I1 plus V2 I2. So what I can say is that V2 is equal to N2 over N1 times V1, right? I could plug that in here and I could say N2 over N1 V1 times I2 equals zero. What's What can I do next? V1 drops out of that, right? And this guy becomes I1 equals negative N2 over N1 times I2. What does that mean in this case? Well, what that means is the current is flowing in here and I2 is actually flowing out of that dot all right, so a current that flows into a dot on one side ends up causing a current to flow out of the dot on the other side. That's what the minus means, is that I2 is drawn improperly, right? In other words, I2 actually, the current's actually flowing against it. And what this tells me is the current magnitudes relate through that relationship, all right? So um, basically what I end up with is this relationship, all right? V1 equals N1 over N2 times V2 magnitude. And then I1 equals N2 over N1 times I2. So you look at those, they're pretty similar, but they're reverses of each other. 
And I wrote that for magnitudes. That expression is always right for magnitudes. All right. So if I in what this way I think about this too is the is the side with more turns always has more voltage. That's a check. The side with more turns always has more voltage. All right. So there's a hundred more turns on that transformer I said that goes from 24 kV to 240. There's a hundred times more turns on the 24 kV side than there is on the 240 side. Doesn't mean there's a hundred turns. And one turn just means there's a hundred more, right? All right, <clears throat> we don't get into the exact numbers of turns or whatever typically, right? Okay. Um, so we, what I do is I always check for the magnitudes, and then I I think about the directionality by looking at the circuit itself. Okay. All right. So um, I don't have much time here, but I'm going to try to set up this guy and just kind of think about it for a second, okay? So in terms of this picture right here, I've got I1 and I2. How do I want to set this up? I have an ideal transformer that's four to one, okay? So I got V1 and V2 here. So there would be, a, there. so if I think I've got a current flowing into the dot here, what did I say that does on the other side? Causes a current to flow out of the dot on the other side. Okay, so it was what I what I think is going on here is that I one is here, and the secondary side current would be that. Okay, so what would I do if I tried to set up a relationship? Well, what do I know about V one and V two? How would V one relate to V two? Well, V one over N one would be equal to V2 over N2, right? So in other words, I know that V1 over four is equal to V2 over one. So that tells me that V1 is four times V2. Okay, we're gonna use that information later, okay? What do I know about the currents there? We'll call this guy here, bless you, IS, right? What do I know about I, S, and I, 1? The opposite has to be true, right? So if I go back to my, my relationship here, I, 1 is the primary current. I, 2 is the secondary current. I look at this and I say, well, I, 1, uh, I, 1 is equal to 1 over 4 times I, 2, okay? Right. I looked at this and said N2 on top, N2 is 1, N1's on bottom, N1 is 4, okay? So that's how I got to that relationship. And I'd be careful, I labeled it as IS here, all right, IS. Now, in terms of this guy here, I, I do have a current labeled as I2, but I2 is going the opposite direction as IS, right? So how would I, that means that this would be negative one fourth times I two. Mm -hmm. You guys follow that? Probably not. Okay. Um, we'll go through this more slowly on Monday. All right. I think we're at time. All right. But um, if we get a chance, maybe we'll talk about this one a little bit more in recitation.